As a youth, as a, as a child, uh, at my grandfather's farm, he had an old shanty. And, I, and he lived out in the country, he had his own farm, he built himself. And I think everyone had a shanty, and that's where you tossed all your tools, scrap wood, firewood, coal, and everything. But when we would spend weekend or a week, one week there during the summer, I used to love going in there and digging through the whole pile of nails and screws and just hammering away and creating away. It was after my father's death that I inherited some of his tools. They sat at my house for probably two years and I thought I, I need to do something with these to in respect to my father. So I started to make a box, just a square box. And I found out quickly how difficult it is to square up something that's typically square. Um, and it was a, then it became a challenge. And once I accomplished that challenge to square up a box, then I accepted the next one and went on to the next one and the next one. And I found that I was thoroughly gratified by the starting of something and seeing something completed. Dedicating yourself to something and seeing an end in, in product uh, within a few days or a few weeks. I consider my woods to, to be functional art. Uh, there are some items that are beautiful and you put them on a shelf and you enjoy them. Um, but my art pieces I like for people to touch. I like for them to touch as frequently as possible. And the jewelry boxes, keepsake boxes, things like that. I like to think in my head that people are going to those every day and taking something out, putting something in. The coffee tables, the end tables, they're looking at, they're seeing, they're putting things on. Um, they're functional, they're functional art pieces. Um, and there are others that are just wonderful pieces of art that you want to look at, that you don't necessarily want to touch. But I like to consider mine functional. My items that I make are not for the generation that buys that. My items that I make uh, they're designed to be for multiple generations. I know I will not be around to see that, but I would be very gratified to know that the person who bought that item plans to pass that down to their grandchildren um, and their grand-grandchildren and will be in equally as good of condition as when they purchased it. I am very much an, uh, an advocate of diversity, in appreciation of diversity, not acceptance and not tolerance, appreciation and celebration of, of diversity. And I try to reflect that in my projects. You will see in most of my projects two tones, uh, at least two tones, um, and the diversity that exists in the projects. I like celebrating that. I like recognizing. The other aspect of my work is that I do not use stains. Uh, all the woods and all the different tones in the woods are natural. And they're the inner part of a tree. And I think it reflects our beauty on the inside that comes to the surface when we allow it to. Uh, they're natural colors, they're natural grains, they're natural beauty and they're, they're not treated with um, um, stain or some artificial color, an artificial exterior. It is a real exterior, and it relates to how I see people around me, the celebration of diversity that's around me, the celebration of the beauty that people have uh, on the inside that comes to the surface, that comes to the surface and people can see. 
And when you're beautiful like those woods are on the inside, then you're beautiful on the outside. As a veteran, I believe very strongly that veteran stories need to be told, voices need to be heard, and what this museum stands for in regards to our United States, not just Des Moines, is very, very significant, very significant. I grew up in a small community called Chesterfield, which was a poverty community, but it was a beautiful little community and very diverse. I received my letter of, of draft notice on Friday the 13th. So I went to Fort Polk, um, did basic training at Fort Polk. Uh, with AIT at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, was trained in artillery. And in Oklahoma, we were trained in the 105 Howitzers. In Vietnam, we shot the 155 Howitzers. For the first time in my life, if you will, I had my own bed, I had my own sheets and, and bed covering. Uh, I was giving like three sets of clothes. I had never had three sets of new clothes before in my life. Uh, new boots, whoa, that's, I have never had a new pair of shoes in my life. Um, I had three meals a day. I had never ever had three meals a day in my life. Um, and I'm getting paid for it. Got my own roof over my head, there's no breeze coming in, no animals walking through and so forth and so on. Shower, running water in the house. I did not have one running water in my house uh, all the way from junior high through high school. Running water, electricity, or heat. My greatest fear was not in regards to what I would be facing in basic training, was in regards to being down south and the things that I had seen in the media and heard and so forth and so on. Um, and I had my strong preconceived notions about anything with anybody with a southern accent. Um, and then I got in my unit and had friends or had people in the unit that were Southerners that talked with strong Southern draw. And I was a Yankee. And um, uh, so they had, so these guys had their preconceived as well. It took about four weeks, if you will, for that to do a total turnaround and recognize and appreciate them as a brother in the military, in the, in, in, in the task that was before us. We've watched after each other and protected each other's lives. The year was 70-71 that I served in Vietnam for, for one year. By then, there had been enough on the news that I pretty much had a good idea where I was going. And it was very common. If you were, uh, if you were a minority, if you were in poverty, you were not in school, you were going. And so... Um, um, I kind of thought, again, talking more in high school when I was, I was an athlete, very, in, very involved, and some level, high level of success there too. I had thought that I would be getting scholarship uh, to college, and so I didn't really think that I would end up there. But, and as I tell young people now when I speak to them, part of getting a scholarship is also having grades. And I focus more on, on being eligible, not that I couldn't receive the grades, because that was proven later. But I focus more on staying eligible and staying more physical fit and skilled in that area than I did academics. As a result, I, I graduated on time. I was eligible, but my GPA was so poor that there's no college that would, there's no college that I wanted to go to to specialize in wrestling or playing football that would take my grade point average. And so while I was waiting for the letter from a college of, for a scholarship, I got the letter from Uncle Sam instead. So I had an idea as to where I was going. And I definitely knew what I would be doing. In the middle of the night when we got on these buses um, and there was a Jeep in front with a 50 caliber, a Jeep in back with a 50 caliber, uh, um, they have the bus driver and then a military person got on with a 45 on his hip and the buses started and all of them locked and loaded at the same time, putting around in the chamber. You knew that this was not basic training. You knew that this was not pretend. Anxiety, fear set in and it really doesn't leave until the wheels hit 
the United States again. I recall very vividly being the rookie in country. You were told to prepare your gun, period. And you take your, your huge howitzers, you put the trails together, you put the ammo on the back, uh, or put it in another, another slate and your, and your food and so forth, your sea rations on the back. Then you get on top of this howitzer, which is probably um, a, a good 50 feet up there, and it's strapped on four sides and you hold this ring, Chinook comes in, blowing sand and dust every which direction, and you're, my job as a rookie was to hold it up over my head, put this ring on this hook on the Chinook, and then hopefully jump off of it to the ground before he takes off. You've got to stack those Joes, and you've got to put them in a proper place. You've got to, you, there's a lot of work you're going to do. You have to build up um, uh, three layers of um, sandbags. 155 Hollow, sir, is a pretty big cannon, if you will. It can shoot a 98-pound Joe approximately 20 miles. It comes in two parts. The 98-pound Joe is approximately um, three feet, 32 inches tall. We would get uh, probably um, six to eight rounds out in one minute and uh, you're doing it one by one person, slamming that in there, and then you have powder bags, um, and they have several powder bags depending on how far you want it. The next person, the rookie, uh, new to the country, their job was simply putting the powder bags in there. You simply have to flip the switch to or, or pop, pop the fire pin up. And, but if you pop the fire pin up, you better get your hand out of the way in a hurry, because there's, there's a heck of a recoil. And so that's why they have a string, then you get your hand out of the way. Um, if you're lucky. Then you have to pull the gun back up, put it where it goes, get it, and it takes all that time, and people need your help out on the country, out, out, of the, out of the jungle where they're taking fire. And so the, the gunner at the top with the scope, he has, a, he has a location off someplace that he looks in and then he has to make sure that the tube, that his, his screen is back in that location, knowing that the tube is right again. There's things that you have to do. Socializing with command and so forth is not an option. Um, one, one LZ that we were at, we were able to take the boxes that the Joes came in. When they came in crates, break them down and actually make a building. It was kind of a bar, if you will. Well, since I don't drink, I never went there, so I didn't socialize with, with them. And I was usually on my, on my bunk, uh, reading or listening, listening to music or, or doing some task. So I'm not a real, I'm not a big social butterfly. Uh, went in as a, as a drafted, two year service, came out as a buck sergeant, as a, uh, and um, um, the highest rank you can, you can receive in two years. And so I had the opportunity to have all of the tasks there. In Vietnam and in combat, you've got a brother, a very good friend, and suddenly they're gone. And you must complete your mission. You must move on. You never have an opportunity to mourn. You never have an opportunity to reflect or whatever. And then when people go to the wall, it all comes out. I was overwhelmed. I was taken back a lot. If you want to live, you better know with the partner, the guy next to you, how he breathes when he walks, what his walk sounds like. He is you, an extension. It makes no difference of their ethnicity, it makes no difference of the socioeconomic background, it makes no difference in all this other stuff. When you're that close under life circumstances, you, there's no room for hate. There's no room for dissent. There's no room for prejudice. Long story short, Vietnam, I went in as an immature, uh, somewhat naive little boy uh, and came out a more focused, um, motivated young man. I was in the jungle being fired at and firing. 72 hours later, I'm here in Des Moines. And I wore my uniform for about two or three days after, after getting back. Uh, when I went to see my mom at her work, I wore my uniform and a couple of other places. It was the most dress up thing that I had. Walking downtown and observing people and so forth and walking from first in uh, Locust or Grand 
uh, all the way down to maybe, I don't know, maybe 13th or 14th and then going up one block and coming back. That was just window shopping and looking at people was really nice. I wanted to do that and I wanted to go to my grandfather's farm and put my hands in Iowa black dirt good and smell that black dirt in Iowa because I was really tired of red clay. Went to um, Merle Hay Mall and over by Sears and Merle Hay Mall is a huge water tower. Okay. And I went there with the only girl that kept corresponding back with me all my time in the military. So my, my, we were dating. And so we parked in the, military, parked in the, uh, in the parking lot. We we're walking into, getting ready to walk into the mall. They were repairing that water tower. I don't know what they were doing with it, but I think like a rivet gun. And they put, I hit it like three times with the rivet gun, power rivet gun. Sounded just like an AK-47 bouncing off that wire, water tower. When I, before I knew it, I was pulling her under a car in the parking lot at Merle Hay Mall. You know, just an instantaneous response because of the sound that I heard from the, the rivet gun hitting this water tower. I had to transition to the U.S. People believe that since I was a Vietnam vet, that one, I was an alcoholic or a drug user or abuser, and that I'm a little crazy. And I want to tell you that there are so many, there are many, many, many Vietnam vets and combat vets who are living a normal life, who are contributing to our society and our community, who are making something of themselves and of their community, who are raising a family, who are living a life that is complementary to our community and society. No matter how they served, whether they were in the front lines, the back lines, or whether they were in the states doing stuff, all of that is important. The wax that were here, many did not serve in a combat area, but what they did here in the United States was direly important. So no vet is a burden upon our United States. It enhances our United States. It makes us what we are. I thought I was able to speak Vietnamese until I came back to the United States and was asked to translate. And I found out I was speaking very much broken Vietnamese. And they were speaking more English than I was uh, Vietnamese. Major, major firefights almost always happened at night. We were involved in a very, very heavy firefight on Easter Sunday. Started very, very early in the morning, like uh, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, and it lasted until sunup. Um, and after people were able to, the, the, the smoke cleared and the sun was up and people were able to see the demise of so many bodies, then that was, that, that was one of the biggest and, and deaths in a firefight. And again, it was an artillery unit, but you could not use your 155s at that time because they had gotten through the perimeter so close that they were useless. It, it was the, the rifles or the handguns at that time. I thought, I really shouldn't be here. And seeing some of the things that happened already in combat, I really shouldn't be here. Uh, I should actually be deceased. And, but I'm not. And I'm okay. So God's watching after me. I wonder why. I wonder what his plan is for me. I'm very curious about that. Why is it that I survived all these close death and should have been death experiences and so forth? So I established that one goal is that I need to find out why. When I get out of here and get out of Vietnam, I need to take a closer walk with God, my Savior, and find out why and what his plan is for me and do it. And that, that's it. And committed to that. The other key aspect that I learned while I there, while I don't regret having been there, is that I thought about my future and what I want for my family, my children, and what I wanted for what I want for them and my family, my children was not at all what I experienced myself. And I thought for me to be able to provide for them better than I had for myself, the key element was education. And I'd committed at that time. If or when I get out, I'm enrolling immediately into college and getting an education and, um, and being so that I can better provide for my family than I had for myself. I have an opportunity to work with a group of very fine young men, a really cool, neat group of boys. I really enjoy it thoroughly. Uh, they're called the Backyard Boys. They get along. They know each other. They have an idea of each other's cultural characteristics.
One of my goals with the boys was to not to grow up like I did and wait until you are in, the, in your late teens in the military to learn that the world is not a hostile place, that people outside your community are not anti-you. When you believe that the world is a hostile place, the way that you approach the world is very different than if, when you believe and you know that it's a very welcoming and accepting place. And so we do things on a regular basis outside of the community. The reason that we are able to do these activities is because people outside of, of their community love them and they recognize that they are quality people and they want them to have a quality life. And as a result, I think the boys are growing up with a very, very rich wealth of experience regarding their community, diversity, acceptance of everyone, and recognizing the world is not a hostile place. And so how they choose to approach the world is more open, friendly, welcoming, and sharing. Ebony and Ivory, um, you know, I was a puppy when, they, when, they, when that came out. Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder playing that together next to each other and singing it together on the, on the, on the piano, it was a major, major impact, a major impact on me, a major turning point for myself. And then later, Michael Jackson, I love his song. Um, if I want to make a change in the world, I need to start with a man in the mirror. And I think all of us need to start with a man. Before we look at saving the world, before we look at saving our state, before we look at saving our community, we need to look at saving ourselves and establishing peace. Before we look at, we can establish peace in the world, or establish peace in the state, ask, do I have peace within? Am I a loving, caring person that has peace within so that I can spread it throughout?